way it is. <laughs> yeah, okay. everybody, take a minute to go through the pages and see all who are here with us. Wow. How wonderful. Lots of folks we know. Mm -hmm. Aloha, Kumu. Aloha. 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 We all look like little dots, but we see you. <laughs> <laughs> good, oh, good, good. Yeah, you're all a postage stamp size. <laughs> I'm giving you my best shot, but I'm beaming aloha in your direction. There you go. Got it. Ah, <laughs> oh. oh, so wonderful. So um, there may be folks joining, you know, over the next little bit, um, and uh, but I think we can get started. And if folks missed the beginning, I can watch the recording a little bit later. Ah! Hey, who's that? Hey, <laughs> Charles. All right, so I'm gonna mute folks. Let's see. You make speaker view. Okay. Uh, well, welcome everyone. Uh, it's really wonderful to have everyone here. And as has already been said, it's it's you know some folks I know, many folks I don't know. All of us. Um, there's a, a little. We have our own sort of range and circles that have all been, um, you know, decided to to come and join us for this uh, event, which feels so important for us and so meaningful and just very joyous. So really happy to have everyone here. Um, my name is Jesse Maceo Vega Fry. Um, I'm right now just north of Kauai Hai on the Big Island, um, dry side. We just had a little earthquake up in Waimea this morning that actually took out our internet for like four hours. So at the, up till half an hour ago, I didn't have internet. I wasn't sure how this is all gonna <laughs> play out, but uh, really uh, happy it's worked out. Um, and um, I work with the organization uh, Vipassana Hawaii um, that has kind of help shepherd this project together. Um, you'll see Michelle McDonald and Stephen Smith are both on this call. They are founding teachers, guiding teachers. Um, we're a Buddhist organization that they began in somewhere around 1983 um, in Honolulu, which is where Steve uh, was born and raised. And um, our lineage of uh, Buddhism comes out of the Theravada and Buddhist tradition. Um, and in particular, our, our lineage is out of uh, Burma, um, often now called Myanmar, um, a place that um, Steve and Jake, who you'll meet, uh, practice for many years. And we still visit every year to um, collaborate with our, our community there, our sort of lay community and our monastic community that we try to, um, the teachings of which we're trying to preserve and protect and um, have flourish in, in our world and in, in our time and cultural context too. Um, I think I'll just share a little bit of a story of kind of how this came to be and then let the, let the, the our wonderful presenters uh, speak for themselves and, and offer what we're really all here for. Um, some years ago, Stephen and Michelle, in their efforts to promote the Buddha Dhamma in their way, um, through this organization, uh, purchased some land up in Kohala, up here in, on the Big Island, Hawaii Island. And um, that kuleana of ours kind of um, persists. And so there is this really powerful, beautiful land up there that we have responsibility for and continue to try to take care of. And we do have a vision for having it be a place where you know these practices and values can be nurtured and offered. Um, but mostly still, it's been just kind of maintaining the land and trying to take care of it over these many years now. Um, on that land, um, there are a number of very just powerful moving um, realities. And one of them is a, um, a very, still very well intact uh, Lo'i system. Um, for folks who don't, aren't familiar so much uh, with Hawaiian history and culture and reality, the Lo'i is the traditional 
um, terraces and which under which um, kalo taro is grown and continues to be grown in a lot of places uh, throughout the islands. And it's, you know, these incredibly sophisticated systems of irrigation and cultivation. Um, this one has about, I think, 16 different um, terraces that are just really beautiful in, in the um, halava, ahupua, um, in Kohala. So, of course, the, the sugar company that owned that land for many years did not really maintain that low-e system. Um, and in the years that we've been trying to take care of it and protect it for some hopefully future uh, value for the community, um, of course, there were cows and there were pigs and weeds and kind of destructive elements at play for many years. And so uh, finally, we got the cows out. And because of COVID, uh, I was able to sort of be a little bit more out in the land this year, not traveling so much. And up this spring, um, just realized without the cows, of course, the weeds were growing throughout this low E. And I didn't, you know, we're, we don't want to do anything. We're not like moving stones or doing anything constructive on that low E yet. We want to make sure we have the right partners and protocols in place. But I realized that if we didn't uh, start dealing with some of those weeds, it was going to take over more and more, especially the halikoa coming down from the cliffs. And so as I started weeding um, and trying to get rid of some of these more bigger things that were going to be more destructive to the structure that was there, I I had taken a class with Kekuhi, a couple of workshops of um, Oli, and felt like I had a few Oli that felt appropriate in terms of my ability to just um, honor the spirits of the land, honor the land, and make sure that sort of my intentions were clear and that I was clear with my intentions and that that carefulness with that engagement um, felt like there was some level of shared understanding. Um, and I also at some point realized I wanted to offer something from our own tradition, that I wanted to offer something that was more specific about the loving kindness, quality of heart and mind that we try to bring to our work and that we have as a vision for our ongoing work you know, in Hawaii. And so I started chanting also this Karenia Metta Sutta chant, which we'll uh, learn more about you know, today in the Pali language in which we've inherited it. And of course, that felt good. And it felt like it's a beautiful thing if you read anything about it. Um, and you'll see the Pali language and you'll hear more about how it was translated, you know, into Hawaiian directly through the, um, through the English uh, as well. But it was clear that there was something missing, right? That actually, I felt like I needed to be able to chant it in Hawaiian, that it felt like appropriate to be in the language of the land and the spirits there to feel um, pono, you know, to feel like I was doing it really in a way that felt in accord with um, our deepest intentions. And so I kind of figured, oh, well, there's been Buddhists in Hawaii for so long, there must be some other translation of this somewhere, right, that someone has done. So I couldn't find anything. I got in touch with our friend Norman P. Inaya, um, who got me in touch with uh, his friend, uh, Kevin Kuniyuki, who is the director of the Buddhist Study Center of the Hompa Homanji uh, in Honolulu. And he and I had a few exchanges, and he felt that um, while they did have some Hawaiian translations of, of different uh, chants in their own tradition, and um, that they had their own kind of metta loving kindness chants that they had uh, created and, and practiced and what kind of are a little more Western sounding um, uh, from the kind of Christian traditions, right? That they were sort of trying to feel like they could uh, be in alignment with at that point in history that they were kind of, you know, coming into prominence, but that there didn't seem to be a Hawaiian language version of this uh, sutta. And so then um, he reached out to Puakea Nogelmeyer, a friend of his, um, and uh, colleague and comrade, and uh, Puakea generously offered to, to work on the translation um, for us and to, to do this. Of course, not for us, really, but this idea that, well, I started with this idea that it was like, oh, I, I need a Hawaiian version of this chant. <laughs> that of course, it's like we have, we are the new kids on the block in terms of Buddhist lineages in Hawaii and feel like we wanted to be able to offer something actually to our um, you know, Hawaiian cultural um, 
reality and host culture here, as well as our other Buddhist lineages that are, you know, predate us being here and, and to be a part of something that even if we disappeared tomorrow, we feel like we could offer this thing um, as, as something to the, the living embodiment of, of Hawaiian culture now and of, of uh, Hawaiian Buddhist culture as well. So Puakea, uh, we got him in touch with our friend Jake Davis, who's, um, I'll read quick bios of folks before they get to talking. Um, but uh, they worked together um, and collaborated on this translation and spent a few months really, it sounds like having a very good time working with one another and collaborating on this uh, process. And then because I had taken some Oli classes with Kekuhi, I reached out to her when they were finished to see if she might be able to do the voicing. And um, again, she incredibly generously also offered to do this and um, you know, offer her, her beautiful heart and skill set around this, um, this wonderful project that we just feel so happy has kind of has come into fruition. Um, so uh, today we'll hear from them and, uh, you know, get to practice uh, the Oli ourselves and to hear a little bit about the, the stories and their kind of confluence today. So um, I hope I didn't take too much time with that, but I wanted to sort of offer a little bit of context for sort of how this came to be and just to know that it's like we're so happy that this is uh, to have these friends and have you all friends uh, be here with us in this kind of celebration of this but that also that it's also like um, it's it feels like a gift. There's so many gifts everyone has been giving, and we want to make sure that we also all feel that sense of responsibility to keep it going, and to know that it's something that like oh if we if we each can practice and we each can continue it and share and teach others that it has the ability to um, be something very meaningful in our lives and in the world right now. Of course, you know there's always so much suffering and so much hardship, ill will, and all these things. And, and to have something um, that bridges, that uh, builds, that, that helps us kind of reorient towards these beautiful qualities of heart is always good. And uh, yeah, we look forward to, to keeping the, the goodness going with you all in whatever way we can. So I'll just offer quick little bios of these folks before we get going, and I'll do them in order of how they'll present today. Um, so Jake Davis uh, began practicing Vipassana meditation at age 14 with Stephen and Michelle. He went on to spend nearly a decade practicing, studying, working as an interpreter, and training as a monk under the eminent meditation master, Saida Upandita, and Saida Ulakana of Burma. He brings together intellectual training, including study of the Pali texts and a PhD in philosophy and cognitive science with ongoing training in retreat practice and teaching. Puakea Nogelmeyer is professor emeritus of Kauai Hualani Center for Hawaiian Language at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. A prolific composer, kumuhula and dedicated educator, researcher and writer Puakea directs Awaya Ulu, a training project for Hawaiian translation and resource development. Keikuhi Kealii Kanakaole has trained in the tradition of Hula Ahia'a and Hula Pele, chant and ritual for 39 years under Halao O Kekuhi, named for her grandmother, Edith Keikuhi Kanakaole. She has co-produced some of the Halao Okekuhi's most significant contributions to oral and ritual arts stage performances. In an effort to service people beyond the walls of the Halao, Kekuhi has developed Ulu Ka Ohia Hulu Consciousness Seminar and Halao, o Halao Ohia Hawaii Stewardship Training to teach basic Hawaii practices that can connect anyone anywhere to their inner and outer landscapes. So thank you again uh, for all being here with us. And um, we'll start, Jake, if you're ready. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks so much, Jesse. And thanks everyone for being here. It's really an honor uh, to get to do this with you. Thank you, Stephen. Oh, you can't hear? No. It's OK? Michelle says it's too soft. <laughs> um, 
Uh, so it was really interesting hearing Jesse's story of how this had come together for him. Um, sort of chanting in the forest, actually one of the traditional uses of this sutta is as a verse of protection. It's chanted, you know, for instance, when I was a monk in Burma and we were invited to uh, dedication of a new house or uh, things like that. This is one of the verses, one of the paritta protection verses that would be chanted is the karaniya metta. Um, and the story that's in the commentarial tradition, which I'll say a little bit more about in a minute, um, is that this was taught, this karaniya metta text, this sutta was taught by the Buddha to the nuns and monks uh, as a, as a kind of a protection to spread goodwill to the um, spirits of the forest when they were meditating in the forest and getting bothered by the, by the forest beings. Uh, they were taught this, this chant and this practice and used that as a way to create the, the, the sphere of goodwill in which they and the spirit beings would be happy and at ease so that they could practice in peace. Uh, so this metta sutta is um, centered on the cultivation of goodwill. You know, the lines that Puakea and I went through, particularly in the middle of the sutta are very much about spreading this feeling of goodwill above, below and all around to all beings, big, small, little, tiny in between and, and just going through all these categories of beings to share this feeling of goodwill with. Um, uh, but the sutta also is really embedded in the larger context of this Buddhist practice of awakening. And that, I think that's an important thing to keep in mind. Um, as, the, as this text, along with many other texts, have been um, brought into kind of our modern world, one thing that has happened is certain texts get, I want to say, cherry picked, really focused on to the exclusion of others. Um, and the Metta Sutta in that way, this Sutta on loving kindness has been in some ways sort of pulled out of its context often. And one extreme example of that, a different story is a translator friend of mine uh, who translates from the Pali was saying that somebody had brought him uh, sort of a, a text of English translation of this sutta that she, this person had put together by finding this English translation she liked of this word and this English translation she liked of this word and put them together into her idea of the, of the metta sutta. And he looked back at the Pali and it had really no resemblance <laughs> because she had just sort of picked this, the bit of this translation that spoke to her and the bit of that English translation that spoke to her. Um, without really referring, without reference to the larger context of the text, without reference to the original Pali um, language in which it was written. Uh, so when I heard about this project, I was first off really excited about it because of um, my connection both with the, the Pali tradition, but also um, through Burma and, um, but also with Hawaii and both of those connections having come from this um, connection through Michelle and Stephen uh, when I was young. So I was excited about the connection between uh, the Hawaiian tradition and, and the Pali and bringing them together. And also um, a little concerned that if we just went from the English, we could kind of create a, um, a, <laughs> a not very uh, rooted version of the, bringing the Hawaiian meaning across. So. Um, I mainly want to just emphasize what an honor it has been and a total delight to, to work with Puakea. It was just a ball. We, I guess four months went by and we, we didn't really notice we were having so much fun. <laughs> um, uh, and, and I do want to just on the content level um, say a couple of things about places that I really loved. I'd love to tell you about all the places we had fun, but there isn't time for that. So just to pick a, a couple of those and then turn it over to Puakea. Um, I think Puakea may also speak to this, but I, I definitely found that there was a real special quality that I haven't gotten just translating from Pali into English, 
when we started collaborating on this and seeing ways in which translating Pali into Hawaiian would work better than translating it into English. You could bring more of the form or more of the content, or you could bring places where it actually, the, the Pali had um, one set, one phrase that had two possible connotations and you could bring them both into Hawaiian and only one, you had to choose one in English or the other way, you had two different phrases in Hawaiian, uh, sorry, the Pali that had echoed each other and you couldn't bring across that echo in English, but you could in Hawaiian. That, that part was the most fun. And I think Pua Kei and I just had a, had a blast with that. So I wanna give sort of two quick examples before I turn it over to Pua Kea. Um, so the first is this kind of one is two, um, where uh, one phrase actually has two possible meanings. So in the first line of this in Pali, uh, we hear, this is an oral tradition, the, the original texts are orally preserved by groups who chanted them, as uh, we'll chant in Hawaiian. And then the commentaries also were oral for hundreds of years. It said that the commentary, the, you know, if the Buddha was 500 years or so before the common era, the commentaries, none of the texts were written down for that first 500 years. And the commentaries were in something like the form we have them by around that time. Um, so these go back, you know, at least 2000 years, the commentaries and an oral tradition of 22,500 years to the, the sutta itself. So I, I feel that echo when we, when we chant these words. The first line, karaniyam atakusalena yanta santampadam abhisamitya. Uh, so this line, um, says that what this is, the whole sutta is gonna be about what we should do if we're um, practicing, what should be done by one who is skilled at atta, skilled at what's meaningful in life. Um, and then it says, having something, the santam padam, the place of peace. Abhisamecha is the question we're gonna look at right now. So having done this thing with the place of peace, and it could mean just understood it intellectually, or it could mean having experience experientially glimpsed this place of peace. And the commentary, this, you know, thousands of years of commentary on the, on the verse, the verse doesn't specify, it just gives us this one word, abhisamecha, but the commentary says it could mean either of these. It could mean you've glimpsed it experientially, this place of peace, the goal of spiritual goal of Nibbana, or just that you've understood it intellectually enough to be motivated to do this demanding, powerful practice of peace. Um, to work towards that. And um, this is no longer my wheelhouse, but I understand from Pua Kea that the Hawaiian Ikelihi really brought across a, a lot of those two different meanings, the experiential glimpse and also a touch of knowledge as in knowing something exists even when one has yet to see it for oneself. So that was, that was really fun to find a phrase that could do all that work that was in the commentary. I can't, I can't do that in English if I translate. So that's one example of what was so much fun about doing this. And then a second example, um, the two or one, uh, there is two words in the English, uh, the Pali, um, one talking about how somebody who's, what one thing that should be done is we shouldn't be conceited. And so that's usually what gets translated for atimani or anatimani is not being conceited. And then there's this other idea, atimanyeti, one shouldn't look down on others, one shouldn't despise others, it's usually translated. So the first atimani is usually translated as uh, conceited and the second one is tr often translated as despising. But in Pali, these two words are super closely related in a way that you don't see in the English. Atimani is ati plus this verb man, man uh, root to think or cognize. And that's the same exact thing that's forming ati manyeti, which we're translating as despise. So ati means as a prefix that means like above or higher or, um, and, and then this root man is to think or cognize. So it can be like thinking yourself high, thinking of very highly of yourself um, uh, or thinking yourself above others. Um, and so you can see how you get to the English conceited and the English despising, but those English words don't, for me anyway, kind of bring that resonance of thinking oneself highly of oneself highly and thinking of oneself uh, as above others. 
Um, and if my understanding from Puakea was that using the Hawaiian Ho'okano really was able to dance between those two meanings um, because Ho'okana was able to serve both as a description of character where it's conceited and arrogant, but also as an action or perspective towards others, like being rude or looking down on. Um, and so final thing I wanna say is just that once we started to see how the Hawaiian could bring across things and bring across um, form and content and phrasing and rhythm that we couldn't do in English, then in the English translation, when we offered this trilingual translation, uh, poly Hawaiian English, then it forced me to look back and be like, maybe there is some way I can do better in English. And then Puakea and I and Kevin would kind of brainstorm, how can we now, now that we see it's possible to do something like that in Hawaiian, how can we now do the English better to bring that across? So that was like just a beautiful benefit. It was so fun and exciting to see how doing this trilingual translation into Hawaiian, Pali and Hawaiian, that one could then influence and improve the English translation. And with that, I just wanna turn it over to my friend Pokea. Better unmute. Let's see. Yeah, unmute. Uh -huh. And also just for anyone to know, if you want me to share the screen of the text at any point to show people, if, they, if you want them to be able to look at it, I can do that because I have it uh, ready to go. Let's see, Puke, are you there? It might be a good idea to put up Jesse so people can see. Mm -hmm. Let's just, oh, let's see. Puke, we have to unmute you there. Can you, un I think you have to do it yourself. Let's see, on your. Let's see, I still can't hear you. Down at the bottom left hand corner of your screen, of your Zoom window. There should be a little microphone picture. There we go, awesome. Am I back? You're back, right on. Well, that's actually my front, but um, <laughs> you know, actually, if I can, there's so much to say about having been a part of this, and I'm honored to have been a part of it, and um, heavily entertained at being a part of it. But the notion of having the dialogue and the kinds of specifics that we were working out I, I thoroughly enjoyed working with Jake and the access to the original text, but having, just being aware of the commentary that was 2000 and more years old. And now when you tell me it was actually oral for 500 years and then documented in Hawaiian language doesn't have anything of that kind, but to have this kind of interchange entwined into that long running commentary just honors me. I, I think it honors Hawaiian language. Um, and so to back up a little bit, like I said, Kevin and I have been friends since the 70s, since before he became a priest for the Hong Wanji. And uh, he was part of a sequence. I've actually, I've, I've played with translation most of my adult life. And I've ended up doing, because there's a dearth of folks doing, I guess, um, spiritual texts or religious texts for Protestants, Catholics, um, Episcopalians, uh, Baha'i, I'm currently working with the Baha'i. It's sort of been a sequence. You could never have planned this, but it actually has sort of, I would say, layered my sensitivity to text. Um, it makes me look for certain things. But this was a particular opportunity to work with Jake in almost every other setting we're working from an existing English translation of perhaps an older text. Um, and luckily with a, a very present oft times group understanding of what the meaning and intention of that is. But that's like I say, very present. And uh, Jake's access to the Pali text really gave a whole other level of insights that Simply, it's a luxury that doesn't exist oftentimes for at least my part of the work. So in this one, when we're selecting words that'll cover, and every translator's task is to, you know, how do you bound the words that you're selecting so that they fit the bill, but don't wash and don't become too general. Um, 
this kind of translation and having experience with other religious texts is more formal than dynamic. I mean, there is a ritual nature to the text that doesn't allow the simple transfer of the broad idea. It's really the specifics within the text that have become sort of iconic over time. And you have to maintain an element of that. So being able to work with Jake on the ideas and the sequences that, that would put it into Hawaiian, we did find Hawaiian very amenable. And it ended up changing the English translation rather radically in a couple of places because the English word that had been selected for translation, um, as we honed it, the Hawaiian into the Pali, um, we recognized that that English didn't do service. And so Jake and, well, as a team, I guess we sort of rehammered some English out. Um, I'm hoping that everyone has the text or has access to the text so that you can walk through it at your leisure. Um, I found in reviewing it, we had set it down and I think it was three or four months. I can't remember how long it was. It was such a pleasure every week that we both looked forward, all three of us, Kevin too, looked forward to it every week. You know, what's the adventure now? What, you know, how will we stumble this week? Because of course we stumbled all the way along. But um, I have set it aside. There's a hundred other projects have slid across the desk. So when I pulled it up in preparation for this, I just, I found myself delighting again in the sequence of thought, my understanding that was certainly enlightened by my work with Jake and Kevin on understanding sort of the sequence of this piece and the text that we were able to put together still very much pleased me is what I would say. Um, uh, and I want to speak just a bit to Jess, your notion of, um, being out on the land, being wanting to have a really an intimate relation there and being able to offer a, a sort of a spiritual alignment. That has been the motivation for the other religious texts that I have been asked to translate has almost always been from the presence here in Hawaii, just brought up a sense of to make this offering real for myself and, and the setting that I'm in, but also to enhance sort of the larger picture of what Hawaii contains. And I really believe that every one of these, it does serve us to a larger sense of Hawaiian language, Hawaiian consciousness, Hawaiian, you know, as it has always expanded and grown, this becomes part of that. And I think, you know, I see every one of these as sort of a flourishing of culture, language, history, all of it at once. So, you know, I would just say that it is a pleasure to participate in it, but it's also a pleasure to know that it's there at this point. And it only really becomes real if people read it, use it, recite it, and, you know, make it alive. As you know, um, that's what makes it real. And with that, I, I don't know if there's anything else I can add other than that it was a, a pleasure, it was an honor, and now it's a product. I'm, I'm really hopeful that, uh, and I, I would actually almost, I had thought, well, maybe we should read the Hawaiian, you know, just, but I'm not able to do that. I, I, it turns out that my vision is so poor that what happens in the middle is where the fuzz uh, comes out. So, if there's any lines that should be recited, I would ask Gekuhi, who I met Gekuhi when she was about four or five. And uh, so if she's been training for 39 years, she's 44 now. So I think she might've been training a little longer. I'm not sure, we'll see, but I'm delighted to uh, hand this over to Gekuhi and take us on a roll. Poor Kia. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 44. There you go. Yeah, so, I was. Yeah. You were five. Yeah. You never pulled you anyway. Dance for us. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, actually, I'm, I'm actually 54. Okay, then I think you've been training for 49 years, huh? 
Okay, okay. Yeah, awesome. You were a damn good dancer in five. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, is there any um, part of this text, Poke, you want me to read? Um, you know, if you just read the couple of opening lines, I think, maybe the first Poke, would you mind? Sure, of course Because I think the sound of it really sets the tenor for the entirety. Okay. And Kekuhi, I'll just say, um, because I think you got to get a water. If anytime you want, I can share the screen so everybody can see the text. Yeah, uh, let's you, do, do that. you You want to do that? Okay. Okay. Let's see. Can folks see it? Yeah. Okay. Might be a little you, small. Yeah. You want to make it bigger? Um, plus, plus, plus. <laughs> wah, wah, wah. Wah, wah, wah. There you go. Is that okay? Is yeah. it cut off? Okay. And just tell me when to scroll or whatever. Malayla, my kai. Yeah, my kai. So, eia na ano e pono ai ke hana. Ka mea i hia loi ka i ke i o. Ma muli o ka i ke lihi, i ke kula na maluhia. Meia, ka hiki, ka pono, a me ke ku pono. Kia ka hai, ka voi pa he, me ka ho'o kano ole. <sighs> Mahalo e ke hoa. Mahalo oh, yeah. <laughs> Just to hear the setting of it. Oh, and before you start, can I again say that Jake was delighted with the Hawaiian not needing a subject everywhere. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, that made much of our discussion a little more flexible about something can be present without having to be embodied in a person. So that ability is there, those, you know, those elements. Anyway, as you read the English, you'd see lots of that. But We can stop the share screen at this point and bring us back, Jess. There you go. Hui, aloha nui akako, aloha. Tell me aloha. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll take the smiles. Yeah, that'll do. So, um, so, so, what's my story? I, I, I want to um, just jump off where um, poor Kea made some. <clears throat> poor Kea made some really wonderful observations and um so so the first one i want to um um recognize is is this this last um comment that he just made about the fact that hawaii language doesn't need to have a subject all the time at the forefront of <clears throat> of the being or the, the living, or the doing the thing, or the fact that the thing is being done isn't necessarily all, we, we don't need to necessarily know who's doing the doing, you know? And so um, that is, and, and sometimes I just wanna say it because it's, um, it, it's, ha it's a happy place for me to be because I don't, I talk in passive tense a lot of times and um, it irritates people. I think it's funny, but, but passive tense, um, I think um, in, in, in our current, in the, in the larger world um, um, overview, in the commercial world, or in the capitalist capitalist world overview, the subject is necessary all the time. So having a passive voice like I do, it doesn't mean that I'm passive about things. It means that the puhala tree really can exist without my having to... Um, without my having to do anything it just it just does it because it's it naturally does it 
And so, um, so thank you, Paul Kale, for that observation. Um, the the other thing is that I want to go back to what both Paul Kia and Jesse are talking. Um, um, Jesse and um, Jake brought into our view, and that is um, this idea of um, it, it's wonderful to find out that this mele, um, this pule, uh, was for folks in 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 the forest to make good with the forest people and all and, and and the forest people that you can see but mostly make good with the forest people you cannot see and so a lot of our um <clears throat> kuleana in the forest and and just here in the house in the zoom in the in the halau hula in 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 the workspace in the classroom is to be terribly aware of the 99.9% .9 of space that we cannot see. And in, in the Hawaii language and poetry, and then the, the art of Oli, and hula and other art and occupational forms has to in at its core has to do with life liveliness that most of the times we cannot see and so the question becomes for the chanter for the dancer for the canoe person, um, for the carver, for the prayer person, um, the question becomes, how do I um, navigate the way that I, the, the way that I sing, that I think, um, that I sleep, how, 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 how can I be so that what's what might be stuck in my body or way back in my in my um way back in my memory that I don't necessarily want to bring out in conversation? How can I pacify? How can I forgive those parts? before I even begin to chant these images aloud. And so chanting in the forest and at the, at the volcano on the top of a mountain or in a garden, is probably one of my most um, favorite things to do. <clears throat> and, um, that we that we do that practice is a practice of um, being utterly aware of what our impact on the frequency is going is going to be before and after I open my mouth or create that kind of energy around myself. Yeah, so um, so super duper. And so look, the other thing I wanted to um, I, I just there, there's so many um, poignant points that um, the three fellows brought out, and um, can I just can I just say one more thing before we go? Okay, I guess that was a yeah. <clears throat> so. I think what I loved most, maybe what is beloved about this project is, and, and, and again, Jake, thank you for saying that about the commentary. But I think what is beloved and just beginning that way is 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 already 
it's beginning the pulse of it, right? <clears throat> is that through the images of the chanted verse um, and the embodied verse, and then the verse that connects us to our ohana, our relatives in nature. So through that, how many, I can't even conceive how many people whose energy lives in antiquity and who probably have come through time and space right now from 2,500 years ago and are delighting in the fact that that we're act that this is happening. I can't imagine, or I can imagine the ripples of energy that I mean we're only on the we're on the peripheral of that last ripple that was experienced by whoever chanted this last. 1,500 years ago. And to connect to that soul, that, that, that's an honor. That's the honor. That's what, that's what Oli is, is to connect in space, time being of no consequence. So yeah, let's get to work. All right. <laughs> so what I thought might be fun, and if it's not fun, oh well. But um, so um, Jess, if you can, uh, if you could share screen. And what just came to me now is, <clears throat> is this. If it's appropriate, Jake, um, um, Stephen, uh, Michelle, um, Jesse, if it's appropriate, could you um, chant that first verse in language and then allow me to chant the first verse in Hawaiian after you? Is that, that sounds... appropriate? Totally appropriate, totally lovely. Uh, maybe I could just get Jesse to zoom out slightly so we can get both of them on there without. Does that work? I can see both on my screen, but I can't see what you can see or cannot see. Oh, the Hawaiian's going off the edge. Maybe one minus. Uh, uh, like that? Yeah, perfect. You got it. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so uh, Kikuhi, I'll go ahead with the first uh, verse of the Pali. Yeah. Okay. Karaniyam atta kusalena yanta santampadam abhisamecha soko ujucha suhujucha suwa chocha samudu anatimani eyana anoe bunoi te anai te mai hi aloi de ige i u Mamuliok ikelehi te tula na malui Mei kahiki kaponu ake kuponu Kia kahai te waipahe ameta ho o kano olehi Your turn. Santusa cocha, superocha, apoca chocha, salo cavoti, Santindriocha, nipo cocha, apagobo, coleso nano get ho. All who know the mere low. 
Ili ponu itahanam alahi tano Merid ike megalunum hao nu Megamaha oi ule ama kilo pahai Nature could the matter a canty, and I when you pray or for a day. So Kinova came in a hon to Sabasatabo and to Sokitata. Ole Hanaita Himea can oh, Eh, olu, wapale kanamai o ahau. Ah, olu, tanu, na unami apa. Yiki chipana buta ti tasawa, tawarawa nawasisa, tigawa yiwa manta, majimarasa kanukatula. Eh, Oluna, Kole u kuwa kuwa heva no. Jitawa yiva adetta yiva dure wa santi awi dure. Utawa sambawe siwa sabasa tabo antu sukitata. Eh olu ta honu na unamia pa. Ina ha ike ya ki he he pai o to o la ko oni ho i na ha mi ha e o la ni a e o i me hi me hi. Ne propram ne kubeta nati manjeta katacina kanci biarosana partiga sanya nanya manja sadokam echea. Mai ho puni puni te tahi te tahi aho kano aku te tahi mehi mehi mai mana o ho Ino aku ya hai No he uki uki meke ku apu e olu ko Mata ya tani am puta mayo sa eka puta anura ke Ewan pi sababu te sumara sambawa ye aparimana Toh matua ine ho o pale kanalua ena i kiana keiki hane uka hime ka moli a o pela te ano e malama ma u ina me a o a pa u lo a Palena ule. Me tancha sabalo kasmi mana sambawi ye aparimana. Udang adocha triyancha ansambadam oweram asapatam. E mala mi kalukumai ka i palena ule. No te ao holo o ko ai. Ahi luna 
Titan charan de sinova, sayano yavatasa with the mito. Itam satim de tea, brahma metam viharam itam ahu. Ina kua helian hoa moi hoopa. Oi alam meila tanu ohonu. Chitancha Anupagama Silava Dasanina Sampano Kame Suvinaya Gitam Nahi Jatu Kabasea Punariti Paole de Idena Kuita Pono Nihakal I Kopo no o ia i hot ma ke o leita le a ku i hola me tu me da hana u ho u I think we're done here. <laughs> oh, that was fun, huh? Beautiful. Thank you so much, Kikuhi. Oh, my goodness. It's so, so beautiful. <clears throat> so uh, what, what, what time are we done? When you're done. Oh, oh, no, no. Like what? Like this kind of time. There's no... There is no oh, this kind of time. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> yeah, whenever we decide, you know, whatever, you know, I think whatever you want to do now, if you want to work with people on it, or, you know, we should maybe have some time for questions, you know, but whatever people have energy for. Okay. Uh, what, what do you folks want to do? We'll, we'll take a raise of hands. Do you, do you want to just go over the first, um, the first pauku? And then, so one, two, three, four, five, the first five lines. So you, you get a feel of the, um, <clears throat> because it, as you, you get a feel of the flow, because as you've listened, it's, it's the same sound all of the time, just with different words. Okay. So you, you want to do that or no, you want question and answers. Okay. I got thumbs up everywhere and shakas and hands awesome sauce so um we're we're gonna just do the pronunciation maybe i can um or maybe uh, myself or poor care can do a uh, recording with just the pronunciation line by line that might be helpful later on not now okay and then um so we're going to do a line by line. All right. Eya na ano. E pono wai ke hana. Good. I can hear you. Don't worry. Kamea i hia loa. Ika ike i o. Kamea i hia loa ika ike i o. Awesome sauce. 
मामूली ओक इके लिहि गुड इके कुलना मालुहिया Meia kahiki. Kapono. Ake kupono. Kia kahai. Kawai pahe. Ame ka ho o kano ole. Yes. Okay. Now that you've got that perfectly. <laughs> Moving on. So now let's just do the voice. And um and so I I chose uh I chose a style that's that maybe um it it's it, it's a uh, it's oli oli of course the overarching oli oli is to is is just the sound that you're hearing it's 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 the it's the presentation of the voice okay so that that's that's the big the big style and then i chose to um there's this one wonderful elderly woman who's um recorded in the leo kahiko which is a um cd that the bishop museum did some time ago um but she's this wonderful rough voice but as she does this her style chant she turns she just the image of her moves from to this nurturing mother for everyone kind of feeling and so i borrowed her chant style and then used a chant style that we usually use for love songs and the love song doesn't always most times it is a love song a love chant style called the ho ai ai and usually for intimates okay um partners companions in life i i was inspired to use this same style because isn't our partner our companion our intimate relationship with ourselves and how ourselves interacts with our external selves and i wanted that love relationship to really come through so that's why you're you're chanting in this melody okay so so this is how it sounds whatever you sound like just make pretend that was the most perfect way you could do it okay okay good e ya na ano or maybe that's a little low e ya na ano e pono ai ke ha na there's a lot of um notes but try your best let's try that again e ya na ano e pono ai ke ha nai nai so you can have a if you want to or you don't have to have a that's a chance chant technique in itself to have one or not to have one okay um first line again let's go all together holo e ya na ano e pono ai ke ha na okay and 
every line after that is going to sound similar. Okay, let's do the next line. Sorry. See how I we broke that word up, eo, to really ike eo. This that's that's the truth of the meaning in the moment, whatever the truth is. Okay, that's why we break it up vocally. Okay, to really accentuate that idea. So, kamea ihiki, kamea ihialoa, kamea ihialoa, kamea ihialoa. Okay, so when you chant it, kamea ihialoa ika ike ihio. Try that. Let's try that. Go. Kamea ihialoa ika and of course you can go back to this recording and and um do it again okay so let's do the third line mamuli ike so we're gonna hold that one up um at the same uh what you call that thing pitch Oh, no, no, no. I changed my mind. Ma muli oka ike lihi. Ike kula na maluhi. And we're going to sit in that word maluhi. And then pulse the maluhi. You see? Okay, let's try the line again. And you're going to like, as if those letters that thought jumps out in bold at you. Ike kula na maluhi. Ooh. Oh, I'm getting a buzz already. And it's for free, you guys. You get a free buzz. It's like thanks to just chanting. Okay, moving on. Meya <clears throat> kahiki. Kapono Ake Kupo Ake Kupo Ake Ku. So you see that little line above that U in Kupono? So that's called um, Mekona. No, no, get 2020. This is 2020. That's called a Kahako. Okay. So, we're going to linger on that word, kupono. The state of being is pono, but the state itself, establishing that state, is, is the cool part. Okay? Not the cool part. The cool part. Okay. Yeah, that was a good one. So... <laughs> So we're gonna just linger on that vowel a little bit. So me ya kahiki kapono ameke kupono kupo. So we're gonna give it a little height. Kupono. Let's try meya kahiki, and as the comma says, rest. Don't take a breath, just rest. Ready? Meya kahiki, go. Meya kahiki, kapono, ake kupono. 
how long to hold the breath at the end, whatever you like. Okay, we're on the last line. Woo! Kia kahai. Try that. Kawai pahe. Ameka ho o kanson. Again, we're emphasizing that word ho o kano, which means um, not, not thinking of one's self, like it's all about me, it's all about moi. moi. That kind of idea, to be ho'okano in that way. And then, um, so we're going to, um, we're going to emphasize that little mark. You see that little backwards apostrophe you see between the O's? That's called the U'ina. Um, in 1975, it was called the U'ina. It's um, Okina. <laughs> it's called an okina and the sound it makes is this sound here I, I didn't vocalize anything I made a I made a like, like, little thing like that okay that's what it does in the word so we want to oh cardinal we want to just sit on that for a little bit okay Kia kahai, kawai pahi, ame ka ho o kano ole. Ooh, well, yeah, we have a little fancy thing at the end. So you're going to make like a bird in the forest and you're going to give it a little beep, like this. All right, let's try the whole verse. Wait, we're not done, we're not done. We're gonna try the whole verse all together. So let me chant the first line and then you chant the first line and then we'll do that in turn for the rest of the verse, okay? So I don't wanna leave you floating around, all right? Beginning. E yana ano e pono ai ke ha na. Your turn. Kame a i hi a loa i ka. Ike i o ma muli o ka ike lihi ike kula na malu hi. Mamuli Me ya kahiki kapono ake kupono. Kia kahai, kawai pahe, ameka ho o kano ole. Did you do your little squeak at the end? Yeah, experts. Awesome sauce. We're gonna we're gonna stop right there, Jesse, because I think that was good exercise. And um, just nine more paukus, you guys. <laughs> <laughs>
and then um, Jesse has the recording, the MP3 and the MP4, and um, maybe a pronunciation recording is probably appropriate here. So, okay. Hey, thanks, huh? Wonderful. Hi. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kei Kuhi. Mm. Uh, you all better practice. We're going to come back in a few months and each one of us can be uh, recorded and live. Huh? <laughs> can, um, go yes. ahead. Can, can I just step you just to oh, of course. offer rather than a recording, which a recording of the uh, pronunciation would be helpful. But if you all are just mindful of the, the vowels in Hawaiian stay the same. So an ah next to an A sounds like I, right? Sound every vowel on the page. Um, and that that okina, uina, is a letter. It's not a decorative addition to Hawaiian text. It's actually a letter. And it's the stopping of the air. Uh, so if it's not on the paper, don't let your air stop especially while chanting. So, there's no okina there. So if you say eponoai, that's actually knives and forks. Eponoai means to be appropriate. So don't put it in where it doesn't belong. Let your air keep flowing. That's the point. The okina is a stopping of the air. And when Kekuhi said, pause here, but don't stop your air, you know, don't keep that flowing. And those two guides really is, you know, say every vowel on the page and don't put in consonants where they don't belong. Lave hola. Awesome, yeah. So I think maybe we can have a few minutes if anyone has any questions, you know, for any of our presenters about the process or technique or whatever you might have questions, you know, we can take 10 minutes or so and just see if there's anyone who'd like. The, um, the easiest way will be down at the bottom of your Zoom screen, there's a, a participants button. If you click that, then on the right, it should show up all your participants and at the bottom, a little blue wave your hand, uh, raise your hand sign uh, button. Um, sometimes maybe it's under the more thing. Um, but if anyone has a question, uh, you can just do that or you can write it in the chat and I'll, I'll find it there. Uh, so there's Bob Bus got a, a question. Bob, are you there? Let's see, here we go. Okay, am I unmuted? Yes, you're unmuted. Okay, I had, I saw one line, maybe this is for poor Kea, um, and it said, Pilipono Ikahana, Pilipono Ikahana. And then the translation in English is not too busy. And I was just curious, it seems like there are so many ways of Pilipono <laughs> that would go in a different direction, you know, not no, too crazy. I don't, too crazy. Tell, which poku is that in, Bob? Uh, it's the uh, second, the second line of the second. Mecca. Oh, yes, it's to be connected to your work with ease. So I'm not sure exactly what the English says there, but you know, not overwhelmed by work. Pilipono ikahana, not pililo ikahana, not lilo ikahana, but to pilipono, to be appropriately connected to your endeavor. I believe that's how, uh, Jake, you could probably clarify what the intent was on that. But it's a great question because Filippo Ghana could be, you know, don't wander off, stay connected to your work. But in this context, it's saying, do it with ease, do it with, with appropriate sort of connection. Hmm. Does that sort of clarify that, Bob? Oh, very, very much, yeah. It just seems much richer in the Hawaiian than not too busy. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure. Um, the English, yeah, not not overly busy. And maybe, you know, there's still elements of the English that Jake and I were still playing with at the end. We, well, it doesn't really give the full flavor or the, but, you know, English is ongoing, perhaps. 
And just to say briefly about the Pali, Appa Kicho, Kicha is busyness, um, and Appa just being small, but there's really a positive, and I think Kuakia tapped into it there, there's really a positive connotation here of the peace, the ease of not making yourself too busy, not like just constantly stuff to do. It's the peaceful yeah. easiness of not having to, <laughs> not being too busy. Yeah. My guy, my guy. Thank you for the question. Um, I would say some of these, the, the phrases or the turns of words that might seem very familiar and they need to be, of course, looked at in the context of that oh, cool, how they're framed into what precedes and follows. I was saying there's a, an element of the very formal translation and trying to keep that linked very closely to the ritual text in, a, in effect. So um, oftentimes it's the context that provides those parameters. Any other questions? Jesse, do you see Meliana? Oh, no, I didn't. Hold on. I saw Marsha. She's got her physical hand up there rather than. Oh. Meliana. Oh, oh, yeah, Meliana, where are you? I, oh, here we go. I got you. There we go. You can. Can you unmute? Let's see. Perfect. I'm so, holy ow, I'm so excited to, to be actually in a, in a virtual space with everyone. The two of you, please, if you could just give a little EK for us about time and space, because Kikuhi, you mentioned that, you know, in a way space was not or was it time that wasn't relevant? I'm just trying, I've got that mixed up because we're talking about a text that, as you say, is 2,500 years old. So from your Ike and Mana, all the two of you, how does, how does that figure into where we are now in terms of context? I'm really interested to hear from both of you. Kekuhi? Uh, poor care. <laughs> oh, well, I would just speak to, and it's really, it's a, a dialogue that's been, uh, or uh, maybe a presentation that's been uttered many times in ways, is that the dance and the poetry of the dance for Hawaiian becomes a portal that yeah. really brings you across time in many ways. And a dancer who is inspired and can invoke Laka really becomes a doorway to the origin of that text in, in many ways. I believe that the chant does the same yep. in so many ways that it invokes sort of a, I don't know, a space that's not limited by time. You know, not to say that we're doing time transport, but it really does put the mind in a different place. Yep. And I think it can link you to origins in many ways so if that's your question it's really the that sense of how us being able to look at the poetry that was expressed 2500 years ago and be able to wrap our heads around it is already traveling across you know a few millennia but being able to now voice that i think is huge and brings just another layer to that connection so that's the beauty of, I believe poetry is really one of the, the life beats of the human heart. Oh my goodness, that's so beautiful because also I notice in terms of your translations and your um, that to go from Pali to Hawaiian instead of going from Pali English and to Hawaiian just makes so much more sense. I mean, I, I don't, I don't even know what to say about that other than you have to kind of know what it means, but then it's not, you're not translating English, you translate, I don't know. I mean, there's there's an in-between there that is so deep, right? Am I miss, I'm not explaining it right, but you know what I mean. Huge. 
Thanks to me. Hello, hi. Como? Hello, me. I'm going to mute myself, but you're absolutely right, is what I would say. Elena, flawless. Kikuhi, could you? Indeed. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, it, everything Paul Kia said, that, that was my um, first thought. <laughs> that the access, I, so I mean, I teach, I teach this all the time and I say it in different ways all of the time. And um, that is, how is it that we've become so attached to our skin as the wall between me and this Lapuhala tree? So, and so space is not, it's, it's not as, it's, it's like not a thing. <laughs> it, it really isn't. And the fact that we can indeed time travel, that is, re re recollect in our imagination the memories of the um the landscape and the memories of um how this 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 coconut tree that's standing in front of me not just this coconut tree but all of his relatives before him and now i can know all of the coconut trees that ever existed you see so so that's i mean i mean that's that's um that's a reality that that um that we have work to do we have work to assure folks that it's okay to sit there in that reality can i just add in that it's not as though the sort of Buddhist worldview was already embedded in Hawaiian culture, mm -hmm. but that all of the parts of what we covered in, in this piece are all there, you know, and that we strung them together to make this piece come to be. But all of those are considerations and acknowledgements that exist in Hawaiian. And so there's a, a lovely uh, resonance, I think, that that fits back and forth in the same way that, you know, between your skin and the puhala tree, you know, there's a, a sensitivity and an openness that's accessible. And I believe poetry is one of those venues that can, can bring you there. Mm. So, uh, open up those, those kinds of, uh, kinds of thinking and kinds of feeling that allow for it. So, I really encourage everyone to walk through this and not only walk through the text, but to vocalize it, to actually make it yours and make it be in the moment. It, uh, it brings it into place. I just want to comment on the, the Maori, you know, when they say tenakoto, tenakoto, kena, tenakoto, and they're talking to one person. Koto means all of you, but it's saying there you are and the ones behind you and the generation behind and one behind, all of you. A lot, and I'm talking to one person. I'm saying, "Hi, all of you. <laughs> you know, there you all are. There you all are. There you all are." Well, that's I think sort of embedded in that that portal mm -hmm. of being able to move. Hello. Any other questions on that? And I asked that question, but I can't see anybody raising or waving hands. So, Jess, you are the shepherd. I don't see, but I'll do the visual look too, right? The the actual hands waving. I don't see. I don't see. I think I did want to just offer, you know, that there's something in this translation process as a observer 
and then trying to practice in this way to, to like one of the one of the powerful things about the loving kindness practice in our tradition is that it's it's meant to cultivate these beautiful qualities of heart and mind and to you know find our connection to them be able to sustain them they are also part of a kind of group of practices that are understood to be beneficial for the cultivation of like deep concentration and states of like a very absorptive concentration. And what's very interesting to me is like when you translate it to English, you translate it into a language that doesn't have a cultural, a living cultural context for that. There, there isn't a, a spiritual uh, chanting tradition in English language that leads towards that kind of uh, experience of um, uh, kind of deep energetic kind of unification that I'm familiar with. And what I noticed from going to Kekuhi's, you know, workshops a couple of times was like how powerful that experience in the, the Hawaii, uh, you know, Oli is, is like, it's such powerful that the energetics of it, like when Kekuhi, you were saying you get a buzz from it. It's like, it is powerful. It's intense. And that, that aspect of being able to do this chanting in a way that actually brings in that absorptive quality in a way that the English just has, has lost or doesn't have that kind of um, visceral concentrative capacity uh, anymore. It's very, it's very powerful. It's very meaningful, really beautiful. And, and thank you all for giving us that new access to that, you know, in a way that's living and, and visceral and um, appropriate. Hmm. Hmm. Well, I guess, you know, maybe on that note, I'll just, um, I will just kind of reiterate, and I may want to, I'll maybe at the very end we can open up that people can say say out loud their mahalos or thank yous or appreciations. Um, but just you know, for myself from Vipassana Hawaii um, to the three of you and the others that you know, Kevin and others who were involved, just like the deepest, deepest gratitude and appreciation for your efforts doing the work for this, offering today's you know workshop and class and teaching for all of us. Um, it's so important personally, and it feels per like important on, on many levels and so meaningful that I just, uh, there's not words for it. Um, you know, we, we, someone asked, are we going to have more opportunities to try to practice this on Zoom or in community? I don't know. It's a good idea. We can maybe see, you know, we have the Zoom world is now like a thing that we're very much, uh, a lot of our programming is happening in this. So we should think about how that might happen. Of course, we want it to be living on the land as well, living and breathing in our daily lives. And so, you know, part of this also is now you are connected to this land in Halava. Uh, through this and uh, just to offer if anyone is in Kohala or coming through and you want to visit and you want to come, you know, uh, share and if you have any inspiration or vision for collaboration and 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 how we might help make this lo'i and, and the land, um, you know, a living, breathing part of the community in a, in a new way, um, of course, those invitations are 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 more than welcome. Of course, we have also raised some money through your donations for the two organizations that Pokea and Kekuhi uh, run and they're to help support their important work in the world. We will continue that, you know, we'll, I don't know how much it is at this point, you know, we'll gather it together, we'll send out another kind of invitation. One thing I was trying to do and it didn't happen, it couldn't come together in time, but I wanna still make a, um, get someone to do like a letterpress printing of the translation, you know, and mm -hmm. have it be like a beautiful, nice, like physical thing that we can give to the three of you and maybe also use as kind of fundraising for helping support their work. Um, so that's something try to do the, the people who I was in touch with couldn't pull it together in time, but to look forward to that possibility. Um, yeah, and just, um, yeah, we hope that you, you know, stay in touch. Uh, in whatever way and that we can, if, if you have any uh, need that we can be of support in terms of like, you know, promoting this and, and organizing more around uh, this particular Oli, of course, we would be happy to be of service to that. And um, yeah, just thank you all so, so, so much, really. Mahalo nui loa, just, mm, it means so much. And I'm just glad to be again in relationship with you all in a new way and with all of you here on this, uh, this Zoom little uh, quilt that we have going. Hmm. So yeah, I'll, uh, 
Let's see. Can I unsee, unmute everybody? Allow participants to unmute um, themselves. If, can I just? I, oh, of course. Yes. I just want to toss in a word that, to say that, although I think myself and Jake and perhaps Kate Kuhi have really perhaps benefited the most from getting it to this point. But I really feel strongly that when it's a mindful work brings greater richness to those who do it, but it brings more to Hawaii. And I'm, I'm very, very happy that this exists in Hawaiian already. Just on the paper, it's already, it's an enrichment of a tradition that goes back millennia of forever taking in and, and making new and making Hawaiian something that came from elsewhere perhaps but that notion of it be coming into being is one thing and then having it go to all of the bodies that are here and all of the people that that may bring it about they may chant it a bit differently there'll be individual presentations sort of to the world but presenting it to the world just makes that world richer i really i i'm very honored to be a part of this process thank you all I just want to also say super briefly, Kekuhi, what a delight to, it's been, I had a, such a fun time with Puakea over those months. What a delight. And thank you for the invitation to chant back and forth. That was just so cool. So deep. Thank you. Really lovely. Yeah, super cool. Thank you for chanting <laughs> along with me, each and every one of you. So yeah, feel free to say goodbye in the chat or out loud and, and we'll be in touch with the sort of all the follow-up recordings and texts to make sure people have what they need to keep this practice going. Okay. Aloha. 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 Thank you. Aloha. Aloha. Thank you. Aloha. Thank you. Aloha. Aloha Kako. Aloha Kako. Aloha. 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 That was fun. Thank you. <laughs> Aloha. 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 So good to see you again, Jake. Yeah. <laughs> he, he had to go to work, so. No but, worries. I was so happy to see your face, Dick. I <laughs> think it's such a long time. No, I just saw her and the kids. Well, we do. <laughs> Hello, Stephen and Michelle. Thank you for boarding such um, beautiful children in Jake and Jesse and your folk. Yeah. Maybe we see everybody in a couple of months when you've practiced. <laughs> <laughs> Aloha. Uh -huh. Miko-san. <laughs> Temi-san. Aloha. Hui ho. Okay, bye. <laughs> there was a little lovely spot of Afternoon tea. <laughs> <laughs> thank yeah, thank you so.